since the beginning, Bausch & Lomb had a vision for vision. The spirit of founders J.J. Bausch and Henry Lomb has driven this vision and shaped the Bausch & Lomb scene today. The company's founding principles of innovation, perseverance, integrity, teamwork, accountability, and humanity have inspired Bausch & Lomb to become one of the largest eye health companies in the world. But despite the international renown, Bausch & Lomb had humble beginnings. John Jacob Bausch was born one of seven children on July 25th, 1830. I was six years old when my mother died and can scarcely remember her. Our mother was, as I look back, the real head of the family and father was as if lost after her death. With their father barely able to care for them, it fell upon JJ and his two older brothers to do their part as the family providers. JJ's eldest brother took on an apprenticeship for the optical trade. Throughout the apprenticeship, JJ was entranced, seeking to learn everything that his brother had learned. However, once his brother had finished his apprenticeship, he was barely able to sell his spectacles and had to resort to trading them for other goods and services. To make matters worse, typhoid fever spread rampantly across the country, eventually knocking at the Bausch front door. JJ's father passed away, and the Bausch siblings were sent to live with various caregivers, guardians, and family members. As soon as JJ could complete his own apprenticeship in the optical field, he decided to travel to Bern, Switzerland to become an optician's assistant. He had to make the 240-mile journey on foot at only 18 years old. My school days ended. I soon realized that I still had much to learn. The opportunities offered, however, were too meager to satisfy my ambitions. And my only course was to seek my fortune in the new world. On the morning of April 26, 1849, the last bit of winter's chill hung in the air, and J.J. Bausch boarded a boat bound for America. Our departure set the entire village in commotion. Journeying to America was something new to the village, and the good people took as much interest in the event as though I were going out of the world. The journey lasted for 49 days and was accompanied by very many storms. No one had much appetite in stormy weather. Nevertheless, our provisions ran short eventually. Water was a very valuable article on that trip, as we could not buy any for money, and we could not get more than one quart per day. At long last, J.J. Bausch reached America. But what he found in the new world was very much like the old. New York was overcrowded, and the people were struggling, just as J.J. had always seen people struggle. In those days, I had no knowledge for which the great city was willing to pay. And when they said to me, go west, the chances are all out there, I believed them, and landed in Buffalo, where there was room enough. There was room enough because Buffalo was in the middle of a cholera epidemic. Hundreds had died, even more had fled. Needless to say, the city had little use for an optician. JJ spent his first winter in America with little work and barely any money. So accustomed had I become by this time to the buffeting of fate that I lost little time in self-pity. And I was reminded of my brother's remarks that we were both unlucky fellows. In the spring, he borrowed five dollars and made his way to Rochester. He was worse for wear on his arrival. He had lost his watch, his luggage, and with it, his spare clothes. Despite all of this, J.J. remained, as always, optimistic. This, he thought, might be the perfect place to finally start his optical business. 
He wrote his brother requesting the remainder of his share of their father's tiny estate. With this money, J.J. purchased wares to sell and opened his first optical shop. But imported spectacles were too expensive for the small city, and J.J. was forced to abandon the project in one short month, with all his money spent and almost nothing sold. He was forced to take work as a woodturner. It was a bitter step. I hated the thought of abandoning the trade which I knew and loved. But this time, a good fortune loomed before me. I was a good woodturner and had good wages. One year later, I was married to Barbara Zimmerman. Our household accommodations were beautiful to us, and we rejoiced over them like children. But not long after their marriage, tragedy befell the budding Bausch family. JJ suffered a horrific accident at the wood turning shop, where his hand was pulled into one of the buzz saws. Two of his fingers had to be amputated. The operation took three quarters of an hour with no anesthetic. JJ fell ill and was on bed rest for four long months. The accident had one wonderful aspect. It taught me the glory of friendship. One day, after my operation, a young friend of mine, Mr. Henry Lom, called at the house and gave my wife $28 which he had collected. Who the donors were, we never found out. To them, I owe a debt that can never be repaid in this world. This was to be the first act in a long legacy of philanthropy for Henry Long. Henry is famously quoted for saying, think of others first and yourself afterwards. Words he would live by his entire life. JJ feared that he would no longer be able to work. However, instead of getting discouraged, he let this fear fuel his determination. Discouragement, JJ once said, is a luxury that can only be enjoyed by those promised three meals a day. He decided, once again, to give his optical business another try. JJ opened a store in the front of a shoemaker shop in the Reynolds Arcade in downtown Rochester. The store was small and heated by an old stove. Their main source of fuel for the stove was worn out shoes. JJ once commented that it was perhaps lucky that few customers called for none would have remained very long. Since the accident, J.J. and Henry had grown very close. Henry Lom was born in Bergen, Germany on November 24, 1828. Like Bausch, Henry had lost both of his parents at a young age. He was sent to live with an uncle and was apprenticed to a cabinet maker by the age of 12. When the revolution of 1848 arose, thousands flocked to leave Germany. Henry Long among them. In 1849, the same year J.J. sailed to America, Henry Long embarked for New York. From New York, Henry went to Rochester where he found work in carpentry. Henry was keen on the idea of going into business for himself, just as J.J. had done. As a single man, he had saved a small sum of money, $60. On July 25th, 1853, J.J. implored Henry that if he would lend him the $60, he would give him a half interest in the company. They sealed the deal with a handshake. They were only 23 and 25 years old. There was never any written agreement between the two of us. We were two honest men who trusted each other. That trust was all they needed. The next eight years were a constant struggle. J.J. took that time to teach Henry the optical trade, to save money and put everything into the business. Henry Long lived with J.J. and his family until the outbreak of the Civil War in 1861. Henry, who at the time was unmarried, answered President Lincoln's call for volunteers. He enlisted as first sergeant in Company C of the 13th Regiment of the New York State Volunteers. His regiment fought in such notable battles as Fredericksburg, both advancements on Bull Run and Antietam. During his absence, Long regularly sent his monthly wages back to Rochester. 
This was the company's only revenue stream for some time. Bausch was hugely in debt. To keep from despair, he worked long days and spent his sleepless nights at his workshop. Then, one day, everything changed. I had the good fortune to find a piece of rubber on the street, which I thought suitable for eyeglass frames. I heated the rubber on the cook stove and found the material extraordinarily well adapted for the purpose. JJ's vulcanite frames were revolutionary and became the first success for the company. The business grew almost overnight and soon they had to move to a larger, more favorable location on the ground floor of the arcade. In the rear of the shop, on a crude, handmade machine, J.J. Bausch began to produce some of the first eyeglasses ever made in the United States. On May 13, 1863, Henry Lom was honorably discharged from service after rising to the rank of captain. On his return, Lom found a very different business than the one he had left. J.J. now employed four workmen and was selling his wares as quickly as he could turn them out. Even better news, though, was that the company no longer had any debts and, in fact, had $800 in the bank. In 1864, Bausch and Lom made a strategic decision to sell the retail shop in Reynolds Arcade to J.J.'s brother, E.E. E. Bausch, so that the company could focus its efforts on manufacturing. They moved their operations to a new building where they developed one of the first steam-driven lens grinding machines. After we had obtained power, everything went on better. But our inside arrangement was not what we wanted them to be. We were obliged to learn everything, and the perfecting of our product was slow. Nevertheless, the company's sales continued to increase, and the company continued to grow. Soon, the new workshop was too small, and they had to expand to an even larger factory. In 1866, the American Hard Rubber and Comb Company offered J.J. Bausch and Henry Law exclusive rights to manufacture optical goods using vulcanite. Henry Law moved to New York City to run the ever-growing sales department. Bausch and Lom were quickly becoming a household name, modernizing eyewear across the state and soon the country. By 1874, the company had yet again outgrown its workspace. Henry returned to Rochester and he and JJ purchased a bit of land and built their very own factory with ample space for their now few dozen workmen. It was here that J.J. invented and applied the very first nose piece to a pair of glasses. But J.J. was not satisfied. He longed to expand the portfolio to better meet the needs of the community. After discussing the matter with Henry, they decided that they should begin branching out into higher optics. J.J. and Henry's children would become instrumental in this endeavor. Edward Bausch, J.J.'s eldest son, showed an early aptitude for instrument making. At the age of 14, he produced a microscope of his own design. At the time, there were only 18 microscopes in the United States. They were hand-tooled and imported from Europe, and they cost $1,000, an astounding sum for the day. With Edward's aid, Bausch and Lom developed efficient automatic grinding machinery and began producing microscopes at a higher quality and a much lower cost, $100. After winning the award for craftsmanship at the Philadelphia Centennial Exposition of 1876, Bausch and Lom soon became one of the leading microscope manufacturers in the country. By the mid-1880s, the company had advanced into photographic optics, patenting the between-the-lens iris diaphragm and shutter giving rise to the art of snapshot photography. But despite all of the advancements and the acclaim they received as the company grew, J.J. and Henry never lost sight of the community. It was not until 1890, when J.J. was 65 years old, 37 years after starting the company, that Bausch even began paying himself a full salary. We were all healthy. We were all working. We were happy. That was enough. 
JJ was hailed with undying respect. He was a friendly, jovial man who worked hard to ensure that his employees had everything they needed. Henry was regarded as a great philanthropist, always the first to contribute to anyone in need. The pair initiated many departments and programs to increase employee livelihood and prosperity. Bausch & Lomb had its own medical clinic, a grocery store where employees could buy goods at wholesale price, and several educational programs. In 1885, Henry Lawn founded the Mechanics Institute, an establishment dedicated to educating immigrants and young men. In 1887, the Mechanics Institute, through its president, Henry Law, funded the first kindergarten class in Rochester, advancing early childhood education as well as adult. The Mechanics Institute is known globally today as the Rochester Institute of Technology. J.J. Bausch and Henry Long are still honored at the university for their contributions to advanced education. Through the turn of the century, Bausch and Long continued to advance into the photographic arts. They also were sought after by the growing fields of medical and military technology. In 1902, they released the Bilopticon slide projector, a groundbreaking tool with which medical centers and universities could project and review slides. The company was using the latest technology, moving the medical field into the future. But on June 13, 1908, the company suffered its greatest loss to date, the loss of Henry Long. His passing was a devastating blow to the company, to the community, and to the world. Henry Long is celebrated for his commitment to public and occupational health, Long's foresight for public health, education, veteran services, and wellness benefited the community at large, establishing standards that still benefit American families today. Rich and poor have tasted the fruits of his endeavors, and accordingly his death is looked upon by all as the loss of a dear and true friend. J.J., though heavy-hearted at the loss of his dearest friend, knew that he needed to soldier on as Henry would have wanted. He did not have much time to grieve as a new challenge arose, the First World War. With German imports, previously their main source of glass, no longer an option, Bausch & Lomb was forced to establish their own glass plant. They built the plant in Rochester where they could oversee production and make sure that the quality met their exact specifications. Under the oversight of William Bausch, Bausch and Lom produced the first optical quality glass made in America. By 1915, the Rochester plant was America's premier resource for optical glass, producing a staggering 40,000 pounds of glass a day. On February 14, 1926, J.J. Bausch passed away at 95 years old. At this point, the company had divisions, factories, and retail locations across America and Europe. The day after Bausch's death, the company closed its doors worldwide. JJ's courage, persistence, perseverance, and creativity had taken an experiment on a kitchen stove and built it to be a world-renowned and highly acclaimed optical company. And though these attributes drove the company to success, most of the respect paid to J.J. at his funeral was for his dedication to his employees. His casket was decorated with a large bouquet of 95 roses, one rose for every year of his rich life. Through the past century, Bausch & Lomb has continued the legacy of its founders, constantly pursuing innovative technology to expand farther into the field of eye health. From award-winning cinema lenses to the most renowned sunglass design in the world. From the first FDA-approved soft contact lens to industry-leading precision ophthalmic instruments, the robust portfolio upholds the legacy of making quality vision care available worldwide. J.J. Bausch wrote, Perseverance, industry, honesty, and a striving for knowledge have been my maxims. Bausch & Lomb is still infused with those virtues, 
each employee striving to uphold the legacy of Bausch & Lomb.